Chapter 13 The smelt hole of Karakankul was nestled at the core of the stronghold, its immensity stretching throughout the stronghold's third and fourth deeps. Immense columns of stone, their surfaces plated in bronze, reared up from the granite floor to support a ceiling some two hundred feet above. The floor, pockmarked by slag pits and cisterns, was covered in mosaics of red stone, depicting the life of the ancestor god Smednir, the shaper of war, showing him teaching the ancient dwarves how to smelt iron and copper. Giant blast furnaces, fed by enormous sets of bellows, were arranged along the walls of the smelt hall, each furnace connected by a clockwork conveying belt to the ore heaps situated throughout the chamber. Towards the middle of the smelt hall were the refining furnaces, monstrous coke-fed ovens in which ground ore would be further purified. A massive slag hearth stretched along one corner, a low stone table upon which waste slag would be resmelted, a bed of charcoal blazing beneath it. Reducing furnaces and ore hearths were lined across the other wall, situated close to where the sand molds of the metal casters would shape the molten lead or silver into ingots. Throughout the smelt hole, clockwork conveying belts of leather and tin deposited ore onto the ore heaps or carried coke to the furnaces. Hooks and chains fitted to mechanized pulleys swung from iron gantries and stone causeways far overhead, creating weird draperies of steel and bronze. Giant copper pipes brought water down to the kilns, while a fast-flowing culvert snaked its way across the floor to remove any waste. The shudder of great steam-driven fans formed a perpetual susurrus, as the atmosphere within the smelt hole was rotated, and fresh air was sucked down from the surface by fluted vents. Within the smelt hole, the heat was tremendous, each furnace and kiln burning with the fires of industry. The quartz glowstones hanging from the pillars were hardly a match for the hellish and red lights belching from the chimneys of the furnaces and the mouths of the ovens. Strange shadows flickered throughout the hole as dwarves of a dozen clans worked the raw ore of the mines and recovered the precious metals locked within the stone. Around one of the small forges arrayed throughout the smelt hole, Clarak Bronsammer and his assistants worked feverishly to rework the beams of Barazunk which had been recovered from the mines. The pounding hammers of the dwarves rang out as each of the beams was slowly reshaped into a thin sheet of metal. Only Kurga's bright finger, the runesmith, didn't partake in the frenzied labor. His face pale, sweat beating upon his brow, the dwarf had his own task to perform. Seated on the floor, he employed a long, rune-edged burin of Gromril to engrave the steel hot plates of Barazung. Kurgas worked in silence, his face drawn and pale, his breath barely stirring his body as he focused on the work. Fixated upon the rune he had studied in Rune Lord Morag's chambers, Kurgas had no attention to spare for anything else. Time and again he attempted to recreate the magical symbol. Time and again he failed each time feeling a little more of his vitality drained away. It was no small thing to fail in the crafting of a master rune. Even to make the attempt was normally a matter of weeks of the most careful preparation. Kurgas had only been given a few hours. Only the knowledge that Clarak desperately needed a rune magic kept him at work. With true dwarfish stubbornness, the only way he would accept defeat was when he collapsed from sheer exhaustion. Clarak sympathized with his friend. He knew how great the effort was he was demanding of Kurgaz. When he'd originally set the runesmith to learning that particular master rune, he thought it had more time before actually needing it. Now, however, the presence of Ikid Claw and the threat of the Doom Sphere was much too great to brook any delay. It might mean the salvation of the entire World's Edge Mountains. You shouldn't push him like that. Kimril observed, a touch of disapproval in the physician's voice. The strain on him is too great to maintain. Something must give way. Clarak nodded. I know, he said, but Kurgas is the only chance. None of the other runesmiths would even dare try, and Rune Lord Morag would insist on a month of rituals and preparation before going ahead. 
By then it would be too late. I wanted this magic for my own inventions. Now I need it for Ikit Claw's fiendish machine. How can you be so certain the Ratkin will come? Azram objected, as he brought his hammer cracking down against the heated surface of the Barazung, the beam being stretched across the anvil. If the beast is as smart as he seems, now that he's stolen some Barazung, he could study it and make his own. You forget Skaven nature, Clorak said. They are all Fagoraki. Thieves who will never make something for themselves if they can steal it from somebody else. The claw will come for the rest of the Barazung. It's our job to be ready for him when he does. Clorak shifted his gaze to study the complicated instrument set close by the anvil. It was a curious arrangement of tubes and rods, a variant upon the water clock still employed by the most tradition-minded dwarves. This clepsydra, however, was not designed to measure time. Clorak had made several changes to the workings, the most important of which were the copper stakes which bolted the machine to the floor. Sunk to a depth of several feet, the stakes acted as divining rods, feeling the vibrations in the earth below. The glass tubes would act as a gauge for these vibrations, giving a visual impression of their magnitude and intensity. A gang of dwarves marched from one of the other furnaces, depositing a load of barazung sheets upon the growing stack at one side of the refining furnace. They saluted Clorak as they passed. The engineer had warned the workers of the dangers he expected, insisting that only volunteers remain behind to help reshape the alloy. Not a single one of the metal workers had been lacking the courage to stay and help. It had taken King Logan and a formal edict to thin their ranks, leaving only a solid core behind. The metal workers were willing to act as bait, but King Logan wasn't quite so eager to risk the industry of the stronghold just to spring a trap. Clorak reflected upon the dangers of the plan. If anything went wrong, the consequences would be dire. The smelt hole had been chosen only after careful deliberation. The size and scope of the furnaces and the heavy smell of the smoke was an important aspect of the plan. The Skaven were ruled by their nose. Scent was their key sense, far more vital to them than either sight or sound. Deprived of that sense, the Ratkin would be disorientated. Hopefully they would be confused enough to miss the trap until it was too late. There was a contingency, however. If Kurgas could manage to inscribe the Master Rune upon one of the Barazung plates, in that event, should the Skaven make off with the prize, there would still be a chance to stop them. Looks like we have word at last, Forlek observed, turning away from the anvil to watch as a wiry dwarf in the livery of a royal messenger came rushing across the smelt hole. The runner dashed straight at Clorak, bowing his head when he came to a halt. I bear tidings from His Highness King Logan Longblade, sovereign of Karakankul and all its domains, the messenger announced. Let's of the jewelry talk and more information, growled Horgar, more interested in hearing the tidings the messenger bore rather than who actually sent him. The messenger flushed, but kept facing Clorak. The Ratkin have broken into the Six Deep, he reported. Clorak told you they'd be hitting the Six Deep again when the sentry guns in the mine started to fail, Forlek said. Though it was true that the destruction of the sentry gun had given enough warning for the dwarf army to assemble in the threatened section of the Six Deep, it annoyed the ranger to maintain the fallacy that the guns themselves had malfunctioned. There was only so much patronizing of Guildmaster Forrest's pride he was willing to suffer. The Ratkin host is being led by one of their horned sorcerers, the messenger continued. Clorak's expression became grim. The horned ratman was likely Gracier Fankul, a creature he had been warned posed a tremendous threat to Karakankul. Against this menace, he had to balance the danger of Ikit Claw and the Doomsphere. There was no question which evil was the greater. Even if Karakankul was lost, Ikit Claw had to be stopped. 
can Fane Arngar stop them? The engineer asked. The messenger nodded. The king has sent reinforcements to bolster Fane Arngar's command. Rune Lord Morag is with them, and has stated he will make every effort to destroy this creature called Fankual. Then may the ancestors smile on their battle, and may their axes strike true, Clarak said, but not without a note of uncertainty in his voice. Had he been wrong, was Fankul truly the greater menace? If Ikid Claw didn't make an attempt to steal the Barazunk, then what foolishness would it be to stay here while the real battle was being fought hundreds of feet below? King Logan requests the use of any troops you can spare, the messenger said. He fears this is but the opening skirmish in a concentrated attack to seize the Six Deep. An ugly feeling began to grow in Clarak's gut. Or it could be a diversion, he said, convinced of his fury as he made it. Tell his highness that I am sorry, but I still need every warrior. The messenger made a deep bow, then hastened to bear Clarak's answer to King Logan. Don't think the king is going to like you telling him no, Kimril observed. I agreed Horgar. Maybe we should be down there in the six deeps smashing some skaven skulls. A sharp bellow rose from the closest of the slag pits. The top of the pit was abruptly thrown back, revealing itself to be nothing but a piece of canvas with lumps of charred ore glued to it. In the now exposed hole, five armored dwarves now stood revealed. A sixth dwarf scrambled up the ladder leading down into the pit. Unlike his companions, he wore no armor, only a pair of leather breeks and iron shod boots. Swirling tattoos stained his naked torso, forming complex patterns upon which was depicted the rune of Grimnir. The dwarf's beard had been stained a bright orange, the same color as the long crest into which his hair had been shaved. There was fury on Mordin Grimstone's face as he stalked towards Clarak Bronzehammer. The sixth deep! The slayer roared. That vermin is attacking the six deep. Horgar shifted about, moving to place himself between Morden and his master. Sternly, Clarak waved his bodyguard aside. The engineer stared into Morden's hostile gaze. The dwarf had taken the slayer oath almost the moment he had left the war council, vowing to destroy Gracier Fankul and atone for his brother's death. To the bitter Morden, nothing else would wash away the disgrace which held him in its grip. You insisted on joining us, Clarak told the slayer. Morden's expression became livid, his hand closing about one of the axes tucked beneath his belt. I came here because you told me the greatest danger would be found here. Only it isn't. Fanquil is down there, and I'm up here. The slayer ripped the axe from his belt and threw his arm back, as though to deliver a blow with the keen edge blade. Clarak didn't move, just continued to gaze into the slayer's eyes. The danger is the greatest here, he said. In that, I told you no lie. What a rat can want is here, and they will come for it. The engineer shifted his gaze, watching the clepsydra. I don't care about the ratkin, Morden swore. I only care about avenging my brother. Returning his gaze to Morden, Clarak's face became bitter. Then you are the most wretched Zaki who ever took up the Slayer Oath, he swore, the fury of his voice taking his assistance by surprise and shocking even Morden. If the rat can succeed here, then the entire Karak Ankor may be threatened. Every dwarf, woman, and child in the world's edge mountains. But all more than Grimstone can think about is his own shame. Where is the sense of duty that led you to Karak Ankul to warn us of the Skaven threat? Where is the dwarf who understood that loyalty to his people comes before loyalty to his pride? Slowly, the fire in Morden's eyes ebbed. 
Gradually, the slayer lowered his axe. Do not fear, Clorox said, his tone becoming more sympathetic. You may yet get your chance. The Ratkin do not fight honorably. Just because they have sent some of their horde into the Six Deep doesn't mean that's where they intend to make the real fight. A diversion? Morden grumbled, suspicion in his eyes. I am certain of it, Clorak replied. He pointed to the Clepsydra. The water in the tubes was visibly agitated now, indicating powerful and persistent vibrations in the ground below. A vicious grin spread across Morden's face. The dwarf ripped a hair out of his crest and split it across the edge of his axe. Best get back to your place, Clorak advised. Even the rat can know enough to be suspicious if they see a slayer working an anvil. Morden nodded. All right, he said. But remember, Fankuol is mine. The slayer turned on his heel and quickly sprinted back to the slag pit, hooking the edge of the canvas with his axe as he jumped down into the hole. One moment later, the camouflage was stuck back into place. By Valeia, exclaimed Kimril. I thought he was going to split your skull. You must be as crazy as he is to talk to a slayer like that. I just encouraged him to keep things in perspective. Clorox said, shrugging off the concern of his friends. Whatever oaths he has made, more than Grimstone is still a dwarf. Just because you shave your head doesn't mean you forget your duty. Still, to take such a chance... Enough, Clorox decided, waving his hand. We have more important things to worry about. He watched as the violence being exhibited by the Clepsydra continued to increase. Any moment now we will receive some guests, the engineer warned. Let's make certain we're ready for them. Stone shrieked as parts of the smelt hall floor began to melt. Wisps of foul-smelling smoke rose from the melting stones, and an unholy green glow began to shine through the fractured granite. The dwarves at the furnaces drew back in alarm, shifting a little closer to where each had secreted their own weapon. Steady, Clorock bellowed, voice carrying above the sound of crumbling stone. The engineer gave only passing notice to the glowing craters forming in the floor, his eyes locked on the still violently quavering Clepsydra. Hold your places! From one of the glowing craters, a pair of chittering skaven emerged, the foremost holding a weird pronged instrument not unlike an oversized tuning fork, bolted to the end of a long spear. Between the prongs of the fork, a fist-sized chunk of glowing black rock had been fitted, dark energies sizzling about its carved surface. Heavy hoses of rat gut and leather ran from the oversized spear connecting it to a massive generator lashed to the back of the second Ratman. Both Skaven snickered with amusement as they saw the stunned dwarves. From the pit that the warp grinder had gouged from the floor, a rabble of verminous creatures sprang, loathsome Skaven slaves, their skinny bodies covered in scars and sores, crude spears and rusty knives clashed in their scrawny paws. They sprang into the smelthole with an eagerness born of terror, before the last of them had cleared a hole, there came a groaning rumble, and the pit collapsed in upon itself. The Skaven didn't twitch as the squeals of their trapped kin rose from the rubble. The Skaven didn't even twitch as the squeals of their trapped kin rose from the rubble. Instead, they flung themselves towards the closest dwarves, a slavering pack of fangs and claws. Other warp grinders cut their way into the smelt hole disgorging scores of emaciated Skaven slaves into the chamber. The dwarves at the furnaces dived for their weapons, drawing a wild array of axes and hammers. The sight of the weapons made the slaves hesitate, forcing the warp grinders to go them onwards with snarled threats. Steady, Clarak called out once more, still watching the Clepsydra. 
Now the water was sloshing about so violently that it had been almost whipped into foam. There was no need to explain the call for patience, however. Every dwarf in the smelt hole could feel the quiver in the earth, not unlike the tremor of an earthquake. The dwarves at the furnaces were now beset by the slavering Skaven slaves. While the ratmen engaged the metal workers, dying upon their vengeful hammers, the warp grinders circled around the melee, seeking to assail their enemies from the rear. Cowardly cheese thieves, Forlex snarled. The ranger drew one of the steam pistols Clarok had armed him with. The engineer, though, set a restraining hand on his friend. We cannot interfere, he said, the words bitter as wormwood in his mouth. We can't do anything yet which will make the Ratkin suspect the trap. They mustn't warn their master. One of the warp grinders successfully completed its circuit of the melee. The strange machine whirred into life, a nimbus of green light gathering about a stone fitted between the forks. As the energy gathered, it was drawn out by the forks, crackling and sparking in a blaze of electricity. Chittering with sadistic amusement, the warp grinder's wielder thrust it towards the back of a dwarf. The victim cried out, scream wailing through the smelt hole. He crumpled to the floor, a ragged hole melted through his torso. Clarak, shouted Horgar, we have to stop them. The engineer shook his head. We will get our chance, he said, pointing to a pack of slaves charging towards their own position. But until their chief arrives, no shooting. We don't want them scurrying away and warning the others. The injunction was hardly popular among Clarak's bold-hearted comrades, but each of them understood the necessity of his warning. Firming their holds upon their weapons, the dwarves made ready to meet the enemy. Keep them off, Kurgaz, Clarak said, gesturing with his thumb at the runesmith. Unlike the rest of them, Kurgaz had made no move to arm himself. Instead, he was set upon the task of engraving. No, Thagoraki is getting past me, Thorlek swore. Bad as you smell, they'll probably take you as one of their own, Horgar laughed. Thorlek might have replied to that insult, but at the moment he was too busy separating a ratman from his head. Other slaves flung themselves at the rest of the dwarves. Horgar smashed down one with his hammer, cracking its skull in a dozen places, and then broke the spine of a second in his metal hand. Azram slashed the legs out from under another ratman, breaking its neck with a kick of his boot, when the main skaven tried to bite him. Kimril took his walking stick, breaking it open to reveal a slender Gromril blade. Plying the stick like a cafe and spear fighter, he dropped three more of the scrabbling ratmen. Clarak Bronzehammer didn't wait for the skaven to come to him. Vaulting over the anvil, he pounced upon the oncoming pack like an enraged lion. His strong fists smashed out, cracking snouts and breaking ribs. The engineer's objective wasn't to kill the ratmen, but simply to debilitate them as quickly as possible. He rushed past the crippled enemies, intent upon the warp grinder crew beyond them. Already the warp grinder was trying to circle the combatants, to come upon the rear of the enemy. The crew saw Clarak as the engineer broke the leg of the final slave standing between himself and the warp grinder. Frantically, the ratman activated the weapon, setting energy crackling from the stone and dancing about the prongs of the fork. Before they could fire, though, Clarak threw himself into a long dive, his momentum carrying him past the final two skaven. He turned his dive into a roll, tumbling past the warp grinder. As he came back to his feet, the dwarf sprinted towards his comrades. Laughing wickedly, the ratman operating the warp grinder raised his weapon, prepared to unleash the corrosive energy against his fleeing foe. A squeal of terror from the skaven behind him, the one lumbered down by the heavy generator, brought the other ratman up short. Turning his head, he saw arcs of green lightning crackling about his comrade's body, and a ratman frantically trying to adjust the dials on the sides of the generator. A torn hose flopped obscenely from the side of the generator. The operator stared in stupidity at the now inert warp grinder, then squeaked in horror as he understood what was happening. 
In diving past the warp grinder, Clarak had ripped the hose connecting energy into the weapon. With nowhere to go, all the energy was building up inside the generator. The warp grinder operator turned to flee almost the same instant the damaged generator decided to explode. The destruction of the warp grinder sent the last surviving slaves attacking Clarak's comrades scurrying away in retreat. The ratman stumbled and slid as the floor continued quaking. Suddenly, a green glow began to rise from the ground a few hundred yards away. The dwarves watched with a feeling of dread as a stone started to melt, creating a pit easily ten times as vast as the holes carved out by the warp grinders. Across the smelt hole, the embattled metal workers suddenly found themselves alone. With their master coming, the skaven withdrew, forming into a tight knot of squeaking flesh which eagerly cheered the underlord whose brand they bore. The shriek of dying stone shattered the walls of the smelt hole, setting chains swaying and gantries rocking. A great stream of foul smoke billowed upwards, as a giant metal snout erupted from the floor. Shaped like some immense gemstone, the metal snout crackled with the same green power as the much smaller warp grinders. To the destructive energies had been added a cruel mechanical augmentation. Rings of metal teeth circled the snout, rotating in opposite directions at an almost blinding speed. A pair of mammoth-sized ratmen pushed the immense drill upwards, its wheels horribly clattering on the jagged lip of the hole. The rat ogres had suffered horribly under the ghastly influence of the arcane science. Each of them had had their arms replaced with metal hooks, which had been bolted into the back of the drill, and crude engines had been inserted into their bellies, glowing with the eerie green resonance of warpstone. Rusty smokestacks were stapled to their backs, belching the fumes from their mechanical stomachs. A ghastly ratman wearing an insect-like mask sat on a little chair between the rat ogres, throwing levers and turning wheels as he directed the drill onwards. Behind the drill, a swarm of ratmen came, scrambling into the smelt hole. These were not the naked slaves, but armed clan rats, each skaven bearing a notched sword or spiked mace in his paw. Upon the shields, the symbol of clan scryer shone, and the fur of each ratman bore the brand of Icket Claw. Small packs of strangely garbed ratmen scurried after the clan rats, wearing heavy coats of rat gut and leather, their faces enclosed within strange bug-like masks, their paws hugging big ratskin bags to their chests. Bringing up the rear of the invasion were more weirdly equipped skaven, some of them bearing oversized multi-barreled guns, while others lugged bulky contrivances that looked like the nozzles of pressure hoses. Still others of the weapon specialists were carting huge brass tubes upon their backs, and wearing the insect-like face masks. As the specialists fanned out, moving to support the unrushing clan rats, a small cadre of robed ratmen appeared, their bodies draped in belts and wires, their backs fitted with metal harnesses from which mechanical dendrites arched menacingly over their shoulders. It was among the warlock engineers that Clarak saw the foe he had been waiting for. Ikid Claw had changed his armor since their last encounter, replacing and upgrading the iron frame which supported his withered body. The chief warlock had refined the monstrous claw that enclosed his shriveled left arm, had made further cog-driven enhancements to his ruined body, but for all the changes, Clarak recognized him. There was no mistaking the aura of ruthless evil that a ratman exuded, no forgetting the insane ambition which shone in his eyes. Ikid Claw recognized his enemy as well, locking eyes with Clarak across the immense sprawl of the hole. Hatred burned in the Skaven's gaze, his scarred lips peeling back to expose his fangs. Uttering a sharp snarl, the chief warlock gestured with the halberd he carried. In response, the Skaven troops gave voice to a savage cry. The next moment, the entire horde was swarming over the smelt hole, converging upon the clutches of defenders still standing. Clarak grinned back at Igget Claw. Reaching to his belt, the engineer drew a fat mouth pistol. He saw the chief warlock instinctively flinch as the dwarf's weapon came free of the holster. A coward like his entire breed, Clarak thought although he doubted any bullet could pierce the iron skin that the ratman had made for himself. It didn't matter, though. 
the shot within this dragon belcher was not for the claw. No! Clara roared, holding the weapon high and squeezing the trigger. A flare of fire exploded from the pistol, streaking high into the vastness of the smelt hole before bursting in a violent flare of brilliant light. The most craven of the ratkin shrieked in fear at a sudden illumination. Just one moment later, they had something to really fear. From hiding places on catwalks and gangways, scores of dwarves appeared. Each of the hidden warriors bore a heavy crossbow or a long-barreled handgun. Mixed among them were fat-bellied engineers carrying heavy satchels filled with iron-skinned bombs. Guildmaster Fori had not approved of Clarak's trap, but his disagreement had been overruled by King Logan, forcing the Engineers Guild to cooperate with their rebellious colleague. Whatever their feelings, however, the engineers would play their part in this coming battle. Throughout the smelt hole, the tops of the camouflage slag pits were thrown back, and dozens of armored dwarf warriors burst onto the scene. The unrushing Skaven recoiled as they saw the grim-faced dwarves suddenly appear among them, their superstitious minds finding the manifestation as inexplicable as the conjuration of a sorcerer. The snarling clan rats faltered, no longer quite so eager to come to grips with their enemies. Happy to ply their swords in a massacre, they were less thrilled about engaging in a real fight. First blood was still struck by the Skaven. Snapping orders to the ratman closest to him, Ikidclaw knew that the only way to stir the quailing courage of his troops was to get a smell of blood in the air. Fiercely, the chief warlock raised his halberd overhead, pointing it at the armed dwarves above. Energy crackled about the blade of the ratman's weapon, soaking up the light all around it. A bolt of dark lightning shot out of the blade, hitting the iron walkway above. Storm Demon, the chief warlock named the weapon, endowing it with a hideous magic and then augmenting its destructive power with a warp generator fitted just below the blade. The black lightning exploded across the iron gantry, crackling through the bodies of the dwarf crossbowmen positioned there, metal acting as a conductor for the malignant sorcery. The stricken dwarves didn't have time to scream, only to twitch and writhe under Storm Demon's assault. After an agonizing moment, the scorched bodies came hurtling downwards, their corrupted flesh splashing across the smelt hole as they struck the granite floor. Vengeful dwarves unleashed a volley from their crossbows and thunderer handguns. Bolts crunched down into the skulls of ratmen. Bullets from the thunderers ripped open skaven bodies. Engineers lit their bombs, dropping the explosives down into the massed ratkin. With the precision of their craft, the engineers fitted short fuses to the bombs, causing them to detonate above the heads of their enemies and send a withering burst of shrapnel slashing into their verminous bodies. The shrieked commands of Wicked Claw echoed above the turmoil. Mobs of sword-armed clan rats converged upon the metal workers and the dwarf warriors from the slag pits. Teams of Jezails turned their guns upon the catwalks, sniping at the dwarves shooting down at them. Warpfire throwers played their ghastly flames across the lowest of the catwalks, incinerating every dwarf in reach of their fire. It was the ghastly ratmen with the hollow brass tubes lashed to their backs who took the most murderous toll on the dwarf marksmen, though. There was a reason the specialists were garbed in the same protective gear as the bomb-tossing globadiers for it was the same toxic poison wind which they employed. Loading the brass tubes with their deadly glass spheres, the mortar teams lobbed certain death over the battlefield. The poison wind globes shattered across the stone causeways, unleashing clouds of toxic gas, which slowly drifted downwards. Even as the mortars missed their original targets, the gas would often settle upon the dwarves on a lower walkway, striking them without warning. The Skaven had walked into the dwarf trap. Now the question was whether they would stay trapped. Clarak and his comrades drew their steam pistols. Ahead of them, a horde of snarling ratmen came charging towards their position, hate and bloodlust blazing in their eyes. Five dwarves against dozens of ravenous clan rat warriors. Odds that would test the valor of any human knight. Yet the defenders unflinchingly faced the unrushing tide. At the signal of Clarak, the dwarves unleashed a volley from their steam pistols. 
The repeating weapons sent a fusillade of lead punching into the rodents, spilling their mangled bodies to the floor. Taking more careful aim, Clarak targeted a masked skaven lurking about the fringes of the rat pack. With eerie precision, the engineer sent a round smashing into the heavy satchel of gas bombs one of the globadiers was carrying. Instantly, the globadier vanished in a cloud of green gas which billowed outwards to claim the closest ratman. But Clarak didn't wait to see the results of the shot. Without hesitating, he spun around, clipping a second globadier, one that had been braced to hurl a gas bomb at the engineer. The second globadier flopped to the ground, shrieking as the gas bomb he had been holding shattered against the floor. The corrosive poison wind spread like a low-hanging mist, searing the legs of the clan rats. Some of the Skaven unwisely stopped to discover the source of their hurt, dropping as the toxic fumes burned their way into their bloodstream. Others shrieked and leaped, scrambling over their dying comrades in frantic efforts to get clear of the gas. A lone dwarf charged into the panic Skaven, axes cleaving limbs and smashing ribs at every turn. Bitter laughter bellowed as Morden Grimstone slaughtered his foes, cutting them down without mercy. The body of the slayer dripped with the black gore of Skaven blood and viscera, his axes slick with the slime of his foes. Ten, fifteen... Twenty of the Ratkin fell before his onslaught, but it wasn't enough to slake his lust for vengeance, to drown the guilt twisting his heart. He is gonna get himself killed, grumbled Forlek. The ranger holstered his pistol, intending to join the berserk slayer in his crazed charge, but Horgar's steely grip stopped him. Even for you, that stupid, the hammerer scolded. Morden's looking for a glorious death. He doesn't need any company. Forlek twisted free, scowling at his friend. He might not need it, but he will have it, the ranger vowed. No dwarf, even a slayer, should have his bones gnawed at by ratkin. Horgar shook his head, but he holstered his own pistol and unfastened the massive hammer tethered to his steam-powered harness. He glanced aside at Clarak. How about it? he asked. We stay our ground as long as we can, Clarak answered. He let his exhausted steam pistol drop to the floor and drew a fresh weapon from his belt. He was looking past the reeling clan rats, watching as a fresh horde of Skaven came out of Vicket's tunnel. These were no fighters, but instead were a rabble of naked Skaven slaves. Overseers with barbed whips lashed the wretches mercilessly, driving them towards the furnaces where some of the Barazunk beams were still waiting to be reshaped. Several of the slaves fell as crossbows and thunderers picked them away. A dozen of them were caught in the blast from an engineer's bomb. The overseers, however, did not relent in their brutality, forcing the slaves across the smelt hole to seize the precious metal. Clarak felt his stomach churn. Most of the Barazunk was piled nearby. As long as they could stop the Skaven from capturing those supplies, he didn't think Ikid Claw would have enough of the metal to complete his invention. The problem was, it didn't look like there were enough dwarves to keep the chief warlock from escaping the trap. Kurgaz! Clarak called out. The runesmith didn't look up, his eyes still focused on the sheet before him his Burin still trying to engrave the complex master rune into the metal. Clarak watched his friend laboring, concentrating with the grim determination of a true Dawi, ignoring even the clamor of battle raging all around. Time was growing shorter if the engineer was going to manage his contingency plan. If Kurgas could just get the master rune inscribed in time, then Ikid Claw's victory would turn into the Ratkin's defeat. We will buy you some more time, old friend, Clarak swore. Turning around, he repeated the order to the other dwarves. Whatever happened, they had to make sure Kurgas was undisturbed. It doesn't look like the rat can agree, Azram remarked. The routed clan rats Morden had been pursuing were being swept aside, bowled over by a pack of brawny vermin their bodies protected by thick armor plates. Even under the layers of paint and filth staining it, the lorekeeper could tell the Skaven had scavenged the armor from the dead dwarves. 
What was less obvious was the purpose of the curious pistons and cogwheels fitted to the armor. Clarak gave the armored skaven just a brief glance, staring past them at the grisly figure of Wicked Claw. No, it doesn't, he said. His hand played across the dials of the chain vest, adjusting the settings of the mechanisms, trying to judge the intensity of Storm Demon's deadly magic. After the almost failure of the other vest, Clarak had a better idea of what the device could withstand. Morden's war cry rang out. The Slayer had also sighted the gruesome warlock engineer. Carving his way through the fleeing clan rats, the lone dwarf rushed to confront Ikid Claw. The armored Skaven interposed themselves between Morden and their master, acting with an eerie, machine-like precision. The Slayer's axe bit through the leg of one of the attackers while he lobbed a paw from another. Neither of the ratmen gave so much as a squeal of protest. What spurred it from their wounds was too thick even for Skaven blood, and possessed a weird glow to it. Morden stared in disbelief as the crippled foes swarmed over him, beating him down with armored fists. Zombies! Kimriel cursed, not without a shudder. For the ancestor-worshipping dwarves, there was no greater abomination than the restless dead. They are automatons, Clarak corrected him. Ratkin, who have had their blood replaced with chemicals and their souls replaced with steel. The engineer sighted along the barrel of the long pistol he'd drawn. It was a bulky weapon, not unlike a pared-down thunderer. He sighted down the barrel, then quickly sent a shot slamming into the head of one of Morden's attackers. The explosive shot detonated as soon as it struck the Ratkin, popping its head and sending a spray of chemicals and gears spattering across its comrades. Aked Claw snarled at his guards, cursing their uselessness. The chief warlock glared at Clarak then, recognizing the gold-bearded dwarf as the enemy who foiled him in his previous attempt to build a doom sphere. This time, his enemy would not stand in the way. Gripping Storm Demon in both hands, Aked Claw activated the weapon's warp generator, throwing it to full power. Crackling energies formed about a black blade, a nimbus of dark power expanding from the tip of the halberd. Scatter! Clarak ordered his assistants. Get behind cover! The engineer did not take his own advice, though, instead coldly sighting down the barrel of his pistol. While he stood there in the open, there was every reason to expect the claw to ignore his friends. There was a chance his vest would be able to save him from the crazy warlock's magic just as there was a chance that one of the explosive bullets might be powerful enough to penetrate the monster's frame. Muttering a quiet prayer to the ancestors, Clarak squeezed the trigger, the pistol belching fire as the volatile bullet was sent speeding on its way. In the same instant, Ikid Claw unleashed the ferocity of Storm Demon upon the dwarf. Clarak shrieked in pain as the black lightning crackled across his body. He could feel his teeth being pulled out of his mouth, his hair being ripped from his scalp. The pistol fell out of his hand, the reinforced steel glowing red-hot as it struck the floor. The engineer's clothing caught fire, his skin blistered, his beard began to shrivel. Sparks flared through his vision as the pain impossibly intensified. Abruptly, the black lightning dissipated. Clarak Bronzehammer crashed to the floor, smoke rising from his battered body.